on uh, the future, the present and the future of US foreign policy and LGBTQ rights. Uh, on today's breakout session, we're going to start off with a keynote. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Mayor Claudia Lopez of Bogota, Colombia joining us. And she's gonna tell us about her own story uh, and about her efforts in Colombia with regard to LGBTQ rights. And then we're going to have a great panel uh, and a discussion about US leadership in this very important area. Uh, so with that, let's move to uh, Mayor Lopez and her opening remarks. Hola. Hey, my name is Claudia uh, Lopez and I'm the mayor of Canada. I wanna thank the Inter-American Dialogue and Institute, Victoria Institute for this invitation to share my experiences, my testimony as the first mayor woman, openly lesbian, elected in Bogota for the first time because I uh, couldn't last year. It, 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 this year was very challenged, the pandemic, economic crisis, of a global climate crisis. But this is one of those challenges that where makes you grow up. Uh, it's, I think especially happened to Bogota. And uh, let me tell you a little bit of story about me, how I arrived here, the challenges that I had it meant for me to have this position. The first, first place, since I'm a woman, I'm a lesbian, people presume that I'm an expert in feminism, of course, because I'm a woman and I'm on center left, of course, everybody assumes that, and then that I'm an activist, uh, LGBTQ, or an expert in those subjects. Neither one or the other, there has not been my history in life. I've been a researcher, a journalist, activist, about democratization and peace in my country. And that's been my public trajectory that brought me here. But obviously, if you're the first woman, the first openly lesbian woman that arrives to this position, commits me with this cost, which of course, they're a part of my life that I've been always be close to them, even though they have not been mine. So the first challenge for this position was to put on the shoes to honor the fights of so this LGBT, of many women and feminists that opened the field for this history for he, for us to arrive here. In the case of women, in 1957, the suffragettes, the Colombian suffragettes, conquered the right to vote. I'm saying 1957 is relatively recent. In the case of uh, an LGBTQ activist, it was just a paraphrase in a very famous US uh, sentence, there's no tax without representation. The fight of this conglomerate in Colombia is exactly the same. There's no rights without the representation. We need to achieve representation and public voice and with this public voice representation for those rights to exist first on paper. And after that, just translate them from paper to reality honor those two causes in the one I have contributed as a citizen. I wasn't even also on the census stage of so that in any, any of those has been my first challenge. Honor the story with fights to reflect them in my government program to convince the city that that make those two causes of inclusion. I'm talking about women and LGBTQ with made a better society for all of us, not only those respective communities would turn us into better democracy for everybody, not only those, those people. Second place, it's the same challenges that everybody has gone through. Every leader that we found in this, in this conference um, to make it openly, to make it publicly. Nobody feels, no, nobody feels the shame of being uh, a woman or be part of the electricity TV community and to vindicate to vindicate and, and honor it. And so that even without being feminist or an activist, just, just, just to say, this is who I am. And if you elect me like this, that's fine. If you don't elect me like that, that's fine also. Of course, that's an act of honesty. A personal honesty, but more than anything, is an act of maturity of our society. It's, it's acknowledged, I have to, it's a recognition for Bogota is the most plural, most democratic, most progressive in a city. That's no, that's no reason why, I mean, there's no wonder why I happened here in Bogota. And the third challenge has been to translate 
this history, this legacy, honor it. My own convictions and all this blend, talk about like coalition of center left brought me here to this wonderful position to be the first diverse mayor of to honor in real actions, of course, the challenge is, uh, is to honor the expectations, the expectations of each person of the LGBTQ, which are huge, and all with the reason. The respect for those expectations to be honored, and the way it, you know we, we can put forward more than anybody, inclusion in education, in, in the workforce, and that, at least myself, I have I have a purpose. I have a even though we mentioned all these letters, this you know, with this it was uh, not all these letters, L G B T Q are discriminated against in the same way. I decided that uh, our my team and myself of all these letter, the one that's the most excluded, <coughs> discriminated is the trans population. And if you really can move that forward with that inclusion and the recognition, lower police violation that suffered this the person, people of the community, the trans community, they have half the life expectancy of an average Colombian. And if we can move forward in their education and the guarantee of the rights, their inclusion in the workforce we will really be advancing in the inclusion of all community. So the bet is supposed to make the expectations even harder, to raise the bar even higher. If we just measure in the way that we improve the, situ the situation of the of population LGB, a lot easier. The L lesbian is here, I'm, I'm standing in front of you, but not a trans person, because that's a lot more difficult. So what we have done is to use the highest bar if we can lower police violation, social exclusion, family <laughs> exclusion, education exclusion, and, and, and also the workforce for the trans population. And that should be bar the measures are the results of our government program. The fourth is the most obvious. This cause, before everything else, I'm a citizen, which happens to be a mayor at this point, but in this four years, we have to honor this dialogue open to a lot more voices to show that this position inspires and attracts a lot more activists, social activists to political representation. So we always feel a little bit, very little fearful. Many activists, LGBTQ or women or feminists said, I'm an activist, I'm a social activist, I'm not a politician working with politics. If the citizens don't work in politics, the politicians that don't represent us will stay in politics. But they're conservatives, discriminatory policies. So we have to take politics seriously. And this, I hope, this wonderful opportunity can serve for. So more leaders and activists can go from activism, social activism to representation, we need it. And of course, the way the indicators are horrible, women, that we are only 20% of the congressmen in the government in Colombia, and we're 52% of the population. And not to mention the LGBTQ, nobody knows exactly how many there are in the new census, in, both in Colombia and Bogota will give us a better idea, but this underrepresentation is even worse of, of women. We have to take this step. We need to motivate people to get involved. And it's not easy. Studies and very, very high in political action and inside the parties. But that's what we need to achieve. We need to take that step. And lastly, I want to say that to institutionalize this, not, not because we, we now we have this lesbian mayor took some actions. Uh, so how, how do we manage for this government actions to get institutionalized, like, polit like policy of state? Uh, my my bet for this is to uh, is a, a district district system of care, first to release to unburden the woman of the the, the 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 care they have to to take care of, which that 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 shows the decrease in in poverty. Uh, you reduce poverty, like feminist feminine turning the poverty into feminine. Women take care of of, of reducing the poverty. Uh, so we 
women take care of for the social security system. So what we want to do is to unburden women of the not remunerative work they do, the unpaid work they do. And also the side is to include the most excluded uh, population in their in, in politics, in one of them, is the, is the trans community. So this is the set of actions, not only to have government policies on, I guess, of women and, 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 and the district system of care, uh, usually that that uh, welfare is, is, is federal, the federal state. But Uruguay has been an inspiration for us, but without ones and built and is executed already and put a lot of money to a system that works on a district level. In fact, there's no federal system. It's a system of care that provides services that creates a new inclusive politics like the community, the LGBT community, and also to unburden the major load that the women have to carry. That set of perspectives, I would say, the perspective of my own perspective of our causes to honor expectations, to do warming policies and to institutionalize some of those policies as the policies of, of the state and the city is part of what we can do. We've been 11 months here. We have another just three years, but we have to leave a mark. Leave a mark that will inspire many activists to come into politics and mark that the highest part, which is the inclusion of the trans people, is one that measures the inclusion of the population in general. And also a bar and a legacy that that certain government actions could be institutionalized and honor, of course, and hopefully, so we'll say, the opportunity that we were given. This is the experience that we're having here. And thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to share with you and so, to know so many others. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Lopez. Uh, I think we can all agree <laughs> that we uh, benefited a lot from hearing from such a trailblazer, uh, someone who is not just talking about it, but actually doing the hard work of bringing about equality in, uh, in an incredibly important country and uh, one of the major cities in Latin America. Um, she, uh, the mayor mentioned a couple of things that I hope our panelists, which whom I'll introduce very shortly, uh, uh, we'll discuss. The first is that representation matters. These are, these are things that we talk about at Victory all the time. She said that we need representation in order to have rights. Um, and the other thing she said is that um, the diversity that the LGBTQ community brings to society makes society better and stronger. Um, that yeah, at Victory at Victory Fund, we say America needs us. But I think for the purposes of this panel, we should be talking about the, the fact that the world needs us, actually. And so with that, uh, I'd love to introduce you to our terrific panel. Um, the, the panel, of course, is about LGBTQ rights globally and the need for US leadership. Um, and we have a particular focus on Latin America with today's uh, keynote and with our panelists. Let me introduce them to you now, and then I'm going to invite each of them to uh, provide just very brief opening remarks. Um, as they often say, the first panelist really needs no introduction to uh, the LGBT community. It's Ambassador Wally Brewster, uh, a dear friend uh, of Victories and uh, was US ambassador to the Dominican Republic, uh, was sworn in, I think in late 2013, uh, uh, and um, just did exceptional work, both he and his husband, Bob, uh, in that posting, uh, both in terms of living as an openly gay married couple and embracing uh, the gay community, LGBTQ community in the Dominican Republic, which you know, is not always the most welcoming environment uh, for the queer community, obviously, as we know. Uh, so I, I hope that the ambassador will, will speak to his and Bob's experiences there on the ground and the importance of having support from the 
State Department and from the president as he went about doing his important work. We're then gonna to transition to uh, uh, some brief remarks from Professor Javier Corrales of Amherst University and also the author of a fantastic book, uh, The Politics of Sexuality in Latin America. And I think uh, the professor is gonna share some good news and some bad news from the region with us. Um, and after that, we're going to have, again, uh, someone who needs no introduction to our community, which is Paula Uribe, who is former senior advisor at the State Department at the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs and is now an executive at PepsiCo. And I think Paula is gonna talk a little bit about the importance of partnerships, that it can't just be civil society working on its own, it can't just be governments working on their own, but it's gotta be everyone, including corporations with values and putting those values to work uh, in the regions where they have a presence. And then finally, we're very uh, pleased to have Co Commissioner Margarita Salas of Costa Rica. Uh, Commissioner Salas is the Presidential Commission Commissioner for the Rights of LGBTQI Persons in Costa Rica. Um, and I'd love to have the Commissioner speak about um, the fact that Let's be honest, in the past four years, we haven't seen a lot of leadership on these issues or on a lot of issues uh, beyond them around the world. And I think we've seen other countries step up and really start to play leadership roles themselves. And I'd love for her to talk a little bit about what that means in Costa Rica and what it means really for US leadership. Uh, a big question I think we have to address is, what does US leadership mean? Um, it doesn't, it certainly can't be our way or the highway, and it certainly can't be that way after the past four years. So I do hope whatever we talk about in terms of US leadership, it involves partnership, leading by example, um, and having some humility uh, after the past four years, quite frankly. That's my own personal take on it. But with that, <laughs> Ambassador, over to you. Well, thank you, Ross, and uh, thank you for your leadership. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with the Victory Institute and everyone that uh, is watching virtually. I'm sorry we're not in person, but it's such an honor to be here with such great panelists as well, who I know and uh, respect so much. Um, but I think we all are having a sigh of relief uh, for what the future holds for us. Uh, with that said, you're correct. We have a lot of work to be done, and unfortunately, um, some things have rolled back uh, in the support in the region, and it's critical that we get back there. Um, you know, first, I want to say that it was an honor and privilege of my life to represent uh, the American people and President Obama, and uh, I'm proud to say President-elect Joe Biden, uh, in the administration in the Dominican Republic, which is a country we knew very well. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of work, as I said, because my husband and I uh, are still the only gay couple uh, to serve in that position uh, in the Western Hemisphere. So it shows that even our own country has a lot of work to do when it comes to, um, as you said, representation, which the mayor spoke about. But um, many of you may know, uh, on the day of my nomination, when President Obama made uh, the announcement in the Washington Post that uh, the Cardinal of the Dominican Republic came on TV and uh, national TV and called me a faggot and said, my kind weren't welcome. If I came, I would suffer and be forced to leave. Um, so that started a debate, which I'm gonna talk about elevating tough conversation. Um, and so sometimes those things have to happen and they're positive because you become a conduit. Uh, so look at them as an opportunity. And that's one of the things uh, that, that we talked about, but it gave us great resolve to fight. Uh, and we were prepared by the time we got there after our Senate confirmation to have that fight. And it came from Ultimately, people like President-elect Joe Biden coming down to uh, defend us and to show his support, Dr. Biden coming down, Nancy Pelosi and members of Congress coming down, Susan Rice and Samantha Power speaking up, and a lot of tough conversations, honestly, with the Pope around the situation of one, uh, treating a diplomat of the U.S. without the respect uh, that they deserve, and two, the issues on LGBTQ rights. But when Bob and I got there, and I'm very proud I was able to stand next to my husband through the process, we focused on four key areas um, that, that I'll talk about just briefly. Leadership, visibility, education, and laying the groundwork for the future. 
And that was important in the region because we had known it so well and we knew there was a lot of work um, that just was, especially on the education front. From the leadership, as you said, Ross, uh, representation matters. So we knew we had to be the best. We had to be the best ambassador, the best couple. We had to do a great job better than anyone else. Because if we didn't, people were looking to uh, say negative things and to say, see, it was a one and done because they really don't know how to represent uh, the United States in a respectful way. Um, but also we had to do the things that were important to both nations. We fought against corruption. Uh, we fought for the trafficking, uh, against the trafficking of women and young girls. Uh, we focused on the environment, uh, the drug trafficking, trade and bilateral agreement, energy security for the region. So all the topics that were important, not just for US businesses, but also for the people of the Dominican Republic, but most importantly, representing the businesses and the people of the US. In the visibility, Bob and I sat down in the very beginning and said, we're gonna go to every opportunity of an event that we have, no matter how big or how small, because it was important that they see us as a couple. Um, and so we were there, uh, we engaged in everything that we could, and uh, even uh, made sure that uh, we, though didn't go to certain things, uh, such as an example, if the Cardinal was gonna be in an event, uh, it was very clear that the U.S. would not be represented uh, there and that we would not be there um, as one of the major partners. So, um, and then when I would go in, I would wear this pin uh, uh, when I would go to the president's office if we were talking about human rights or issues. So we knew based on which flag pin I had on, uh, how I felt that day or what the issues were going to be. And then the next thing that we really looked at is education because even our own embassy, and, and Ross, you spoke about the State Department. I had some very challenging conversations with the State Department about being the gay ambassador. Um, and so we have a lot of work still to educate our own State Department. Um, some of my greatest challenges were actually internally uh, with not just staff uh, on the ground, but also those within the State Department because we are blessed as a democracy to have people from the far left to the far right and all in the middle. Uh, working for our government. So sometimes you, you have to continue to have those tough conversations. But at every point, we made sure we did that. On the visibility also, we invited the trans community as well as the LGBTQ community who said they had never been invited to an ambassador's residence before in the Dominican Republic. And that was a challenge for even our protocol people. But they realized once they were there, they were accepted and treated like everyone else. And then the last I'll speak about really is laying the groundwork for the future. Um, you know, I'm proud that my husband, working with Claire Lucas and the Victory Institute and others, found a million dollars um, in a public-private partnership in order to bring um, both the, the Victory Institute, the LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce, and the LGBTQ uh, tourism programs. Um, I'm very proud to say that now, aligning with the other diplomatic communities, um, and I give the Institute great credit. Um, there was no really openly gay candidates running for office when we got there. Uh, when the Institute got there and it's still going strong, there are multiple candidates from all segments of the LGBTQ population running for office, many very successful. So I'm proud to see the progression, uh, but I will say that uh, we saw society change from the time we got there to the time that we left. I give that credit to the organizations that supported us um, both in the U.S. and around the globe, as well as uh, other diplomats. But I also want to say that it was the support of an administration. And if we don't uh, re-engage, uh, there is so much happening around the region that has rolled back. And the communities will tell you around the region they no longer have a voice because the U.S. isn't leading to provide that opening for their voice. So we have got to do that. So I will just say we have to keep the narrative going. Uh, I had an interview yesterday to talk about marriage in the Dominican Republic that is now obviously very controversial today, but we have to keep those narratives going. And so I just implore all of you to, to talk to your friends around the globe and let's make sure with the Victory Institute and others, we keep that going. So I've taken my time a little more. So I'll now turn it over to the incredible professor Javier Corrales and uh, I will uh, uh, opt out to him. And I know uh, I'm looking forward to hearing everybody else's comments. Great, thanks, Ambassador. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador, and um, thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I wanna say, I'm a political scientist. I, I kind of started my career and have been all my life an, 
a researcher like uh, Mayor Lopez, but I haven't done the other things that she has accomplished. I, I, I spend most of my time studying um, Latin America, issues of democratization, and, and now uh, a lot more issues of LGBTQ rights. Um, Latin America provides a remarkable social science experiment on the question of LGBTQ rights. When the most important legal advances happened in Latin America, most of the time, public opinion polls suggested that the majority of the public were against the changes. When a country decided to think about legalizing civil unions, for example, or even better, same-sex marriages, in most countries, the public was in their majority against it. And a lot of people were like, oh, you know, we can't do that. We should not be changing the laws before changing the sentiment of the people. Nevertheless, activists pushed forward, changed the law, always a very difficult battle. In some cases, they didn't prevail, but in many cases they did. And what can we see about this experiment? By the way, that approach to LGBTQ rights in Latin America was a little different from the United States. In the United States, for example, we got same-sex marriage in 2015. And by then, the majority of the American uh, uh, public opinion was in favor of it. Uh, the, what I'm telling you is that the opposite tended to happen in Latin America. Well, here's the good news and the bad news. Um, let me start with the bad news. The bad news is that, of course, there has been a backlash. And in countries that have made significant progress, um, the activists and politicians um, have had to deal with conservative forces that have made a huge effort to stop this and even roll back some of these gains. In some of these countries, they have come to power for as Margarita Salas will probably tell us, they came very close to winning the presidency. So the battle is out there. The, the forces of resistance have, have gained ground. But the really great news from Latin America is that the evidence is in that, as Ambassador Brewster was telling us, the decision to change the law before the public changed produced a number of conversations, debates that didn't exist before and which actually were transformative and changed people's views. And Latin America has now provided enormous evidence that homophobia and transphobia can recede. We see the expansion of acceptance in Latin America, poll after poll, happening in countries that start out with a change in law without public support and the public support expanding. And this is really great. Um, it is in some way something that we kind of suspected was gonna happen, but we didn't have the evidence for it. And now we're starting to see the evidence. It's happening in some groups that are, um, for example, we see it happening far more in urban sectors. We see it happening far more in people with more schooling. And this is the importance of Ambassador Brewster's point on, on uh, uh, education. We see it, of course, among young people, uh, but we're also seeing it among people who identify as religious. Um, this is really one of the most important uh, changes that uh, we are seeing the emergence of um, folks that we could call them, uh, I, I call them light Catholics or light Protestants, that they don't necessarily follow the conservatism of the clergy, but they themselves are far more accepting. Of course, this change, we wish it were more widespread than it is, but the great news is that we now have evidence from the region that uh, starting these legal changes, these policy changes can actually produce a positive change at the level of acceptance in society. I want to join Ambassador Brewster in saying that the region is thirsty for American leadership on this issue in part because uh, um, these groups continue to face a very uphill battle 
Nevertheless, I want to finish by saying that the forces that are on the ground uh, pushing for uh, more inclusion and more representation and stronger laws and better labor practices have never been stronger than in the past. Thank you. And now I want to turn over the microphone to my good friend, Paula Uribe. Thank you, Javier. Um, thank you, Ambassador uh, Ross Margarita. Uh, it's a privilege to be here with uh, all of you today. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about my experience uh, in the State Department. When I arrived as senior advisor in the Western uh, Hemisphere Affairs Bureau, um, I was a political appointee during the first Obama uh, administration. And uh, we knew that LGBT issues and uh, women's issues and other important issues were at the forefront and they were a priority uh, of the administration and particularly Secretary Clinton, who had been a champion uh, for, for the longest time. So um, I, you know, I, I wanna talk a little bit about why I became so passionate and interested about these issues. And um, first of all, I wanna say that three of the most important people in my life um, are LGBT, are members of the LGBT community. Um, they're, they're, my, they're, they're three members of my family, my, my amazing cousin, uh, my brother-in-law and my daughter. And so it's, um, it, it was very close to my heart close and uh, dear to my heart. And I wanted to be uh, a, a changing, um, part of the change that we wanted to push. Uh, so we started talking and uh, we knew that we had support from above. We had a uh, high level support and that was so important. I think that that makes such a difference. And as Ambassador Brewster said, we faced some, um, some resistance from people within the State Department. They were not super excited about this new way of doing things. And um, we just went ahead. I, you know, I, I, I decided I needed to change minds. And, um, and we had a very amazing group of leaders at the State Department we created the LGBT uh, task force within the State Department. And then we also had an interagency group uh, where we all discussed how, you know, best practices from different regions, from different bureaus within state. Um, we decided that we needed to start educating people inside and outside that the US leadership you know, was was extremely important. We had partners um, in NGOs with other governments, multilateral organizations. And so we started building something huge that accomplished an amazing amount of things. The first thing we did was in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs, I'm gonna claim credit for that, uh, was to send a cable right before pride to all embassies in the region, telling them that they needed to, one, have ambassadors write op-eds, two, start having conversations with LGBT uh, civil society NGOs, um, that, that they needed to have the attention from the US government uh, because it was, really important for them to feel supported and protected, especially since the US is a huge um, aid, um, you know, supporter of, uh, of, of foreign aid in the region. So we wanted to have those conversations. We wanted to mainstream LGBT rights. And as you know, just like we work with other human rights NGOs, with um, NGOs that 
work on women's issues and so on and so forth, we wanted to bring in the LGBT uh, activists and, and, and empower them because most of the time they're not empowered. So it was an amazing journey. I think it was the best job in my whole life. And I'm proud of what we accomplished. What makes me really, really um, sad is all the, you know, the retrocess that we have faced in the last four years because we did accomplish so much. And one of the other things that I feel um, proud of is the creation of the LGBT rapporteurship within the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And that was a big effort. Uh, we got funding from the US government uh, during the president's, uh, President Obama's visit to the region, to Latin America. We actually were able to get that as one of the deliverables in the region. And we um, put the seed money, the US, uh, to create that rapporteurship. And then what we did was, you know, we, we went out, I actually went out with a hat on my hand, asking for money from other governments to get this effort funded. And we did it. And the, the final goal was to have the same thing created at the UN. And now we have my good friend, Victor Madrigal, um, at the UN doing, you know, uh, doing that job. So um, I think it's, it's a question of educating. It's a question of uh, being passionate uh, about the issue. It's a question about doing the right thing uh, as a government, as a individuals, regardless of what we think um, or what we believe religiously. Um, I think it's, um, it's a question of having people get used to inviting uh, LGBT uh, activists to embassies uh, like um, Wally and, and his amazing husband did at the Dominican Republic. We actually had other ambassadors do the same thing. And one thing that I want to say is uh, Roberta Jacobson, when she was ambassador in Mexico City, she, um, it, it, she, you know, she was ambassador for a little part of uh, the Trump administration. And I remember living in Mexico City for a couple of years and she arrived. And in June, I went to a meeting across the street from the U.S. Embassy. And it was so amazing to see a huge rainbow flag at the US Embassy, even during the Trump administration, that I actually felt, you know, we, you know, we still have people doing the right thing. And we'll get back to that um, once <laughs> this is over. Um, so, you know, that's 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 my story. And um, and I'll talk about the private sector after. I'll I'll hand it over to Margarita. Thank you, Paula. Commissioner, you're up. Hi, I'm a proud Latin American lesbian feminist. And these issues of LGBT rights, they, they don't feel like issues to me. This feels like the everyday needs and lives of me, of my family, of my close people. My wife and I can live in the same country thanks to the changes in legislation that we've managed to achieve in the past few years. Um, so I definitely think that uh, Claudia Lopez's uh, call that in a, in a sentence could be summarized as what you know very well, if it's not us who, if it's not now when, is that was definitely a strong calling for me to move from being a social movement person to being uh, a government, uh, a government official. You know, often political parties will tell you that these issues, these soft issues, are going to be marginal to any election. 
big surprise for the Costa Rican people when in 2018, the presidential election was defined around LGBT rights. Because we had made a consultation to the Inter-American Human Rights Court and lo and behold, their statement came in the middle of election. And it immediately created it so deep that the whole presidential election was defined around the issue of whether the candidate supported equal marriage or not. Now, it's interesting because legally it had already been defined. It was not up to the candidates to support or not support. But, of course, um, the right wing Christians were making crazy um, Trump like uh, affirmations, such as saying that we would leave the Inter American Human Rights Court, which is not even. Um, a previ of the of the presidency to be. Anyhow, this created a huge public discussion. And we, the LGBTQI movement, had to go to the streets to convince people and make them understand why this was such a big issue in our lives. Uh, we managed to dodge the bullet, which is Costa Rica was one of the few countries in which there was a populist leader running for office based on religiousness and on, on conservatism. And that person did not get elected. So we managed to elect the person that was supporting human rights and, and other issues. So after this, how did this make a difference? Well, the presidency put their full force behind this issue and created not only the office that I hold today, which is a presidential commissioner on LGBTQ issues to navigate the bureaucracy to advance in LGBT rights, but also created LGBTQ commissions in each one of the public institutions. So at this moment in Costa Rica, in the public sector, there are over 58 LGBT commissions in each one of all the entities. And they have the task of developing capacity building for all of the public servants in that sector. By now, we've managed to put over 20,000 public servants through courses and capacity building on LGBTQI um, issues. Also, we've created a consultative council where we coordinate with civil society. There, we've drawn up a national agenda on LGBTQ issues because after marriage, there's plenty left to keep working on. First of all, to defend the issue because the anti-right forces keep attacking, um, but also to move in other issues, issues such as hate crime legislation, such as protocols for intersex, uh, to stop intersex mutilation, uh, work with local governments, uh, full recognition of gender identity, development of uh, statistics for LGBTQI people so that we can create public policy based on evidence and not just on guessing what are the conditions. I think for me, one of the key issues is for us as politicians not to let people forget that we're everywhere. LGBTQI people are everywhere. So when we talk about those who are poor, we are also talking about LGBTQI people. When we talk about the homeless, we are also talking about the trans community, sadly, who face, who face great levels of homelessness. When we, when we face this pandemic and see how people are losing their jobs, those jobs are also the jobs of LGBTQI people, especially because the artistic community has been heavily hit, as well as the entertainment community. And there's a lot of LGBTQI people who work in those areas and also who haven't had access to, um, to better sources of, of jobs. It's very important that we keep working together with the public sector, with the health sector, so that our public services provide, provide for, for all people, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity, quality services that attain their needs. The US is Costa Rica's biggest commercial partner. You guys are the biggest amount of tourists that come to our country. So um, please keep coming. Please avoid electing another Trump-like official ever again. And please continue to do um, alliances to keep working together because it's very important because of the size you have in the world. The politics that you push tend to also shift the international agenda. So we're all developing strong work on the ground to keep pushing for equal rights for everyone. We're not there yet. There's a lot left to do. but. Um, an equality professor of mine once said, you know, put your money where your mouth is in the sense of saying, if you really care about LGBT rights, then you should have indicators to measure that, to measure the advancement. And I think all of our countries could well do incorporating this into our development plan 
into our cooperation agreement and into all the initiatives that we do so that we can guarantee that LGBTQI folks are not being left behind in all of the initiatives that we carry out. Great, thank you so much, Commissioner. That was terrific. If you don't mind, I'd like to pose a question to you first, which is uh, as a representative of uh, a Latin American, Central American country, um, what would your advice be to uh, the US now as we uh, are about to have a new president, uh, a new administration and uh, a new State Department, at least at the leadership level, what specifically should the U.S. policy be with regard to LGBTQ rights? What would be a smart approach to advancing uh, LGBTQ rights, uh, both in Latin America, Central America, and around the world? Because we can't just ignore the past four years, uh, the failure of the Trump administration, not just on these issues, but on a broad array of foreign policy issues. Uh, you know, I mentioned leading with humility. What would your advice be uh, to the new sec to the secretary designate and his leadership team over at the State Department? Well, I think there's um, there's a lot of room to work in the public private sector partnerships, and I think that one of the great demands, and especially uh, coming from the trans community, is the need to find jobs for themselves that allow them to live lives that are safe, that allow them to live lives where they can provide for themselves. So I think that there could be an interesting initiative of, of promoting affirmative action towards the working inclusion of LGBTQI folks. I also think uh, it's important to work with the migrant community. And this is an issue that's very uh, salient within US uh, policy uh, home, which is uh, the migratory status of LGBTQI folks in the US that have fled their countries of origin looking for better opportunities. And here I am talking mostly about uh, the rest of Central America and then of course some parts of Costa Rica where people just have not found it safe to continue living in that country. So if there could be development of refugee status for some of these folks, demonstrated that they have a risk to their lives, which they can, I think this would be an, an interesting uh, proposal. And then of course, continuing all of the capacity development that we traditionally do. I think that sometimes public officials listened best when uh, they're spoken to by other public officials. So I think that uh, technical cooperation where people can hear and learn from public officers how they're implementing specific policies regarding data collection, for example, of, uh, of polls and of LGBTQI data to be able to draw on that policy would be very valuable for uh, the public sector. Terrific. That is uh, terrific. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, any of the other panelists want to remark on what the commissioner just said? Uh, she did mention, of course, the role of partnerships, Paula. So I was wondering if you would like to talk about the role of corporate America. You know, when I was at Google as an openly gay man, I was leading government affairs in Asia, and then I had responsibility for Latin America. Uh, my team uh, knew very clearly that we were going to engage with certain civil society groups that were working on these issues. Uh, and we developed some of those partnerships ourselves. But I do think, as the commissioner said, the State Department has a particular role in uh, guiding those partnerships and starting them in the way that you did when you were there. Uh, what's, your, what's your take on that? Yeah, well, um, you know, companies like, um the company I work for, PepsiCo, uh, we are a champion of equality. We have been for a very long time. Um, actually, in the 1950s, we had the first black uh, vice president at the company, a top executive, uh, during, during a time when the U.S. was, uh, you know, going through, a, you know, uh, uh, segregation and, and, and other terrible things. Uh, we actually have a diversity and engagement office that works very hard on inclusion, 
on um, getting PepsiCo employees who are L members of the LGBT community, um, you know, protected from discrimination. We have very strong, very strict non-discrimination laws, but not just that, because, uh, you know, what we do within the company and in the region that actually also applies to all countries where we, you know, where we operate where we have local employees, but uh, not also that it, it's, we have campaigns uh, that are very well known in the region, in Latin America. We started in Brazil. Uh, we do it in Mexico. This year we're rolling it out in Colombia and other countries. And that's uh, during Pride Month, we um, launch a different package of rainbow Doritos. And, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, attached to the Rainbow Doritos campaigns, we actually promote equality and non-discrimination and, uh, and, and we fight bullying, uh, which is actually uh, a good thing because sometimes, you know, you have a cultural mindset uh, where people are conservative and even our own employees sometimes may be conservative. So we need to actually get things moving and make sure that people are accepting and that they're part of this uh, amazing campaign that we uh, push around the region. Also, we are sponsors of many musical events. We, we, we as you know, we sponsor uh, concerts, we sponsor artists, we sponsor uh, sports. And so what we do is we make sure that during these times when we are sponsoring events and so on and so forth, we avoid sponsoring things that may be um, homophobic uh, because in many countries in the region, we have that problem. We have uh, m music genres, especially in the English speaking Caribbean uh, that, that promote uh, violence and discrimination against LGBT people and women. And so uh, we make sure that whatever we are promoting and we are sponsoring um, is in line with the company's policies against discrimination. Um, I think that's, uh, that's part of what we should be doing as companies, as US companies that are progressive and, uh, and, and that respect the rights of different groups and equality. And, um, it's, it's an example for other companies to follow in the region, like the local companies, for example. Right, I, I found that at Google, we, we were able to lead simply by offering partnership benefits to same-sex partners. And it, by doing that, we set a standard for the entire region where people were competing, other companies were competing for the same engineers. So we, in a way, Set the, set the stage for other companies to follow us. And then there is, you know, when you're a, an outwardly facing brand doing things like we would always march in the local uh, pride parades. Um, and in the case of Hungary, for example, where there had been violence at the pride parade the year before, we made a concerted effort to sponsor and lead the march the following year. And because we were an American company, the police actually protected the march the following year, mostly because corporate America had shown up. So it is interesting. I, I'd love to get the thoughts of the ambassador and, and the professor on this issue of partnerships and you know, civil society, businesses, and governments, uh, keeping in mind, as, as the commissioner said, that sometimes the most powerful thing is a government officials speaking to another government official about these issues? I, you know, I think the conversation is a great one because um, as the commissioner said, um, the one thing that we saw was most effective is just showing up. Um, and when we showed up as the US ambassador and husband, uh, we asked our fellow diplomats from around the world to go to the pride parade with us. It's the first time they had. Of course, it forced the police then to make sure that everybody was safe. It, we asked all of our friends who were in the business community to come. So the representatives of Marriott and other big corporations were there. 
And over a period of time, even through the Trump administration, when the ambassador does not go, uh, now there is a bus of diplomats from around the world that are part of the pride celebration. So just showing up, and as Paula and Secretary Clinton started, is just really making sure that we're looking at human rights reports, that uh, as the commissioner said, and, and we're addressing them, that as the commissioner said, we're involved in every aspect of a government, not just from the State Department, but from commerce, from trade, from every other aspect. And that we're looking at the human rights treatments of not just the LGBTQ community, but any other discrimination that is happening, because if it affects one, it's gonna affect all of us. But most importantly, it's also building a bridge, which we saw um, other governments help us do. And that's between the activists who are doing such incredible work in these communities. And they're the ones that are standing on the front lines every day, struggling to make sure that they're trying to get the rights. And then you have uh, the wealthy LGBTQ community, uh, which unfortunately is limited, but those that are, it's not that they aren't proud of being open and out. There's just not a bridge like there is in the US for them to be able to communicate and figure out how to engage with each other. So it's important that uh, the US government helps uh, working with the other diplomatic communities who lead in this area and making sure. And then the last statement I make, and I'll uh, let the professor talk, is that the religious issue is something we have to lead on. Um, the, Bob and I were with uh, Secretary Albright in Ukraine and Georgia, and we asked activists there during the last election, what is the most important thing we can do? Can we provide money, organizational support? And they said, no, stop your religious leaders from the US funding the religious right. That's what we need. And so the conversation needs to step away from that marriage is a religious issue. Uh, we just want the rights under the law that everybody else has and the respect and the protection under the laws, the, the protection of discrimination uh, against discrimination under the laws. And so I think we have to change the narrative and make sure that we're helping educate the local activists on how and, and how to get that narrative out as well. Professor, any thoughts from you on this? Um, well, I mean, people have said um, extraordinarily insightful things. Um, I wanna um, mention that the region has actually, less so in the past few years, but maybe uh, during the Obama year, made huge inroads in the establishment of LGBT chambers of commerce. And what's remarkable about all these associations is that a buzz is created by local firms who want to join. They want to be able to be seen as uh, uh, working for inclusion. So this is definitely a huge opportunity, uh, a seed that has been created and that can grow and the United States can play a big role. The other area that I think the United States could play a big role and I wanna mention simply because um, um, it hasn't come up. Um, look, homophobia and transphobia is a learned behavior People learn those attitudes at home, in churches, and at school. The United States cannot change home instruction. The United States cannot change uh, what uh, uh, religion instruction does, but it can help Latin American governments change education a little bit. Um, because this is a public sector to public sector association. And we have, the United States has multiple exchange opportunities uh, that, in, that deal with the public sector. And there's a lot of uh, initiatives, many of which emerge directly from the region. And the United States could back many of those initiatives to try to make the um, uh, uh, public education, you know, the, 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 the elementary schools all the way up to uh, higher education much more inclusive and places where people can actually learn to be tolerant of diversity. Great, thank you so much. Both, Paula, Paula you, I'll, I'll turn, turn it over to you in a second, but I do, both you and, and uh, the ambassador mentioned that part of your battle was internal at the State Department, uh, as well as the job of you know, doing diplomacy overseas. So I, I hope we can come back to that issue and how best to address that. But um, over to you. Thank you, Ross. Um, no, I would, you know, I would say that uh, the U.S. actually has a lot of co uh, collaboration with um, 
agencies, security agencies uh, in, in, in countries. And that's one of the things that when, when uh, Mayor Lopez actually mentioned violence and exclusion and other things um, happening in the region, um, I think that that's one of the things that we tried to push. And I think that we should be pushing more and more is when we have training programs, we're training security forces, police, and so on and so forth with U.S. funding, we should make sure that there's training, uh, you know, gender sensitive training, uh, and, and that doesn't just apply to the LGBTQ uh, community, but also to women, uh, gender violence in general uh, that affects both LGBTQ people and women um, are a problem and um, and police sometimes are part of the problem or or you know because they are doing committing violent acts against those vulnerable populations or because they're not protecting them and so I think that training having that as part of what we do as U.S. government would be key and and is key. Great. Would you like to address the issue of uh, the internal struggles that you faced at the State Department? I, I, you know, we know that the, during the past four years, uh, a lot of really talented people basically have left the building, right? So we have a challenge ahead of us of rebuilding our entire agency, our entire State Department, the diplomatic corps, what does that mean in terms of, and at the same time, a very real need to continue advancing LGBTQ equality. Uh, how do those two mesh together? What, what do you think the next couple of years looks like? It's, it's going to be very hard because, you know, one of the things that happened and it wasn't, I mean, when we arrived, um, there have been, there, you know, the, the Bush administration had borrowed in uh, officials that were political appointees who were very conservative. And um, I remember having issues when we had meetings, uh, some of the conversations in internal meetings would kind of spill out from, from the department and uh, end up in the desks of some conservative members uh, of Congress. And we were wondering why, why that was. And so we started thinking, okay, who was at the meeting? Why are these conversations getting down there? Um, and, and so we started finding out that there were a few people who had been left from, um, you know, who were very conservative uh, in the meetings. And so we, we, we identified that problem. And it's going to be much worse this time around because a lot of our good allies, our good people who were working hard on issues, who were part of the task force, um, have left. Uh, they were persecuted uh, by, by a certain lady who had a list of people uh, at the State Department of people who had worked on women's issues and LGBT issues. And so they left. So now we need to rebuild to bring back, you know, some of the people who were champions of equality to uh, identify potential, um, potential uh, problems that we may face. But it's going to take a while to go back to where we started. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, a lot of the stuff that we accomplished is this has disappeared. And I'm going to say one thing. When I was at the State Department, I got a call from a certain conservative organization one day, and they insulted me. They said that I was promoting sin, that I was promoting um, crazy nonsense, and uh, they actually were trolling me online. Um, and uh, this organization was upset because we were uh, negotiating a resolution at the UN that banned 
extrajudicial killings based on different conditions, including sexual, sexual orientation and gender equality. Uh, gender, I'm sorry, uh, sexual orientation and, um, and gender. And um, now I learned that they have been registered and they go as part of the US delegation, this organization. So it, it's, it's gonna be very hard for us to, to recover from, from the damage of the last four years. So just when we need U.S. leadership the most, we have a lot of work internally to do to get us ready to provide that leadership is what I'm hearing. Um, we great. are almost, I am so sorry, but we are, the time just flew by. We're almost out of time. So I'd like to invite uh, each of the panelists to give a final thought if, uh, if, you, if you have something to offer, please. Ambassador? Sure. Um, what I'll say is that first, uh, congratulations to the commissioner and all the work that's being done in our country. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's leadership that I hope we have in, in all the countries in the region. But ultimately, it's the representation. You know, when you have a uh, trans community at the border, just uh, as we spoke about uh, wanting asylum and we turn them away, um, that is something that is a, a, an issue we have to address. So we have to be in all aspects of the incoming government. We have to be making sure that we're training everyone as well um, in all aspects of both the internal government of the US, but also our diplomats that are abroad because they've been abroad, they're doing incredible work, but they may not know how to speak to these issues with the countries that uh, we're, we're uh, blessed to be uh, serving in. Great. Uh, Professor, any final thoughts from you, please? And then we'll go to the commissioner. Um. I, I wanna say that uh, it's important for the United States to recognize that more than leaders, we are basically equal to most countries in the region because we face the same challenge and the same, uh, 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 you know, we have experiences to share, best practices to share, but also we have bad examples that we need to recover from. And it's very important that we approach this issue with this notion that uh, we have made mistakes and, uh, and we try to help each other and learn from each other, not just from one actor. Thanks. That issue of humility, I think that we need to take and, and use as part of our policy. Uh, Commissioner. I think humanity is at a point where it's facing a great crisis because of inequality and because a lot of the models of development that we build are excluding large areas of, of population from our country. So I think that it's good to take an intersectional approach to these challenges and understand that racial issues, gender issues, class issues are also LGBTQI issues. So I hope that we keep addressing these uh, matters from the perspective of eliminating equality and creating better conditions for everyone. And that LGBTQI folks need to be included in that everyone that we legislate and that we govern for. Thank you. Paula, did you have a last thought or two? Just really quickly, I think that we need to work very hard, all civil society, governments, private sector, everyone to accomplish the right thing and that's equality for all. All right, great words. Thank you all very much for your time today and for sharing your insights. I found it fascinating. I hope, uh, I hope our audience, I'm sure our audience did also. Thank you so much on behalf of Victory for, for, for sharing your expertise and your, uh, and your time with us today. Have a great evening. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.